Hello, welcome to this um, PowerPoint presentation for Criminology Level 3, WJEC. And we're looking at Assessment Component 2.1, which is forms of social control. Now, the phrase social control comes up every single year in the exam. About 80% of the questions feature it in some form or another. So it's really important you understand um, social control in its entirety. A little bit on control theory in this PowerPoint, but mainly we're going to be looking at the differences between internal and external forms of social control. And you absolutely have to know this. So without further ado, let's crack on. So social control, if we're going to talk about this subject, it's really important that we understand exactly what we mean by the phrase. So social control is how society persuades us to conform to its norms, its laws and its expectations. So it's how it makes us behave, how it controls us. And society has got lots of different ways that it achieves control over our behaviour. But in general, it can be grouped into two main forms. And as I mentioned previously, one of these is internal forms of social control. And that's where the rules and morality are internalised by members of society so that they don't commit crime. And so the internal form of social control, the control comes from within us. We internalised it, it's part of us. It's what inside us makes us behave. And the other one we have to know is external forms of social control. And these are external factors that prevent us from committing crime. The control comes from outside ourselves. So to give you an example, if I'm bombing down the motorway at 80 miles per hour and I see a speed camera or a police car, it controls my criminal behaviour by making me slow down to 70 miles per hour, which is the speed limit. Not, of course, that I would ever go above the speed limit. And I'm merely using that as an example. So how we are socially controlled can also be both formal and informal. So if you look at this chart here, if we're looking at basic formal social control is written rules usually associated with the state and how it controls our behaviour. So if it's formal, it's from the Houses of Parliament that make laws, it's from the police force that enforce those laws, the courts, the prison service. Whereas at the same time, we have informal methods of social control, unwritten laws and processes, how we behave with our family and friends, social pressure, sanctions, praise, family, education, peer groups are all where these come from. So this really shows, you know, how we are controlled, both formally and informally, and these are the people that do it formally and the people that do it informally. So as well as external, internal, how the sanctions work and who does it can be both formal and informal. But um, enough of that, let's crack on. So let's start by looking at internal forms of control. So one of these would be our moral conscience, or as we've looked at Freud in our um, individualistic theories of criminality um, back in unit two, what Freud would call the superego. So for Freud, the superego tells us what is right and wrong, and it makes us feel guilty when we don't follow it. And Freud believed that developed through early socialization that the superego restrained the antisocial id, gave us self-control, and made, gave us self-control and made us behave in socially acceptable ways. And of course, the feeling of guilt that we have, that our superego gives us, stops us from committing criminal acts. We're thinking to ourselves, oh, if I do that, I'm going to feel really bad about it. So we don't do it. So it's internal. It's coming from within us. So moral conscience or superego internal form of social control. Another one that we could look at is tradition and culture. So our culture, our tradition, the, what we belong to, what becomes part of us through socialization, leads us to accepting its values, its norms, its traditions. And religious traditions are a really good example of this because they affirm someone's identity. They become accepted as part of a 
particular community. So whether you are you know, a, a Muslim who is praying five times a day, all facing the same direction at the Kaaba in Mecca. Um, you know, that idea that around the world, everyone is doing that with you, that feeling of belonging and being part of a particular community. There's that. Or you could have, um, I love Friday Night Dinner, one of my favourite programmes, the fact that in, in Judaism, you come together for the Shabbat meal on a Friday evening, uh, to celebrate that sense of community of belonging to Judaism and that's exactly what's happening with Friday night dinner it's the the writer of Friday night dinner is recalling how they um, they how their family reacted on a Friday night or it's that sort of part of belonging to a country so the fact that in American schools they uh, sing the national anthem and salute the flag at the start of every school day. They're proud to be a, a, a member of a country, etc. So that tradition, that culture becomes internalised, becomes part of who we are. And when we behave according to its, its norms, its traditions, its morals. So that's another example of internal social control. <coughs> then we move on um, to how we internalize this so our conscience our superego our tradition our culture they form part of our personality now originally they start from the outside which is something we do on the outside but the more we do it the more it becomes part of us and it is internalized and we internalize that through socializations so socialization is when the rules of society become our own personal rules, our own personal moral code. And because they are our personal moral code, we then conform to society's norms. We are being controlled socially. And the phrase we use for this is rational ideology. And rational ideology is how we internalize social rules and use them to tell us what's wrong and what's right. And that therefore means that we uphold the law, we stay within the law. So what we could say is, if moral codes are internalised and individuals are tied into them and have a stake in the community they're part of, then that individual's going to voluntarily limit their desire to commit deviant acts. So they are being socially controlled from within, internally. Now, if we move on to the other form of social control, to external social control, these are things that come from outside of ourselves that society actually uses to, again, ensure we're conforming, we're living up to its expectations, we're obeying society's rules. Now, there's lots of agencies of social control. They could be organisations or institutions that impose rules on us in order to make us behave in certain ways. So that could be family, it could be peer group, it's the education system you're in, parents, etc, etc. So sanctions could be both positive and negative. It could be a ticking off, it could be sitting on the naughty step, it could be a certificate of achievement, it could be a star chart on the side of the fridge. But all of these are used by agencies of social control to make us behave. It's coming from outside us. Oh, I want to get a star on my um, on the fridge uh, to show my good behaviour. So it's the outside bit that's making us behaviour. I don't want to go on the naughty step, so therefore I'm going to behave. The criminal justice system is a classic example of this external form of social control. So we've got several agencies of social control and they use formal legal sanctions to make us conform. So the police stop, search, arrest, detain, question suspects. That is all making us conform. It's an external form of social control. The CPS can charge a suspect, can prosecute them in court. The judiciary, the court system have the powers to bail the accused or remand them in custody and to sentence them if they're, if they're guilty. And of course, the prison service can detain prisoners and obviously it's against their will for the duration of their sentence and they punish prisoners' misbehaviour. So all of those formal sanctions 
external forms of social control because it's being done to you it's not coming from within you and of course mainly with the criminal justice system you're looking at negative sanctions but there are a few positive ones you must remember those so for instance parole for good behavior or a lower sentence for assisting the prosecution would be an example of a more positive sanction uh, from the criminal justice system and then this leads us on to coercion so coercion is another external form of social control and coercion and i've got my little definition up here for what coerce means it's basically to use threat of force in order to make someone to do or stop doing something so that could be physical or psychological force or other forms of pressure so it's a threat if you don't do this i will do this and so it's forcing you to behave in a certain way and the negative sanctions of the criminal justice system are perfect examples of coercion so an example of coercion that you can use in the exam would be cctv it's a method of used for social control it's a really good one to have as a case study cameras occupy an area record events so that an authority figure doesn't have to be there so it makes it easier for police to control criminals and it's also more reliable than many witnesses to crimes because it's there in black and white or in color now it also allows the person monitoring to determine whether someone's in danger or if police assistance is required in stopping a criminal offending so it doesn't mean that you know, it means that police aren't called out falsely or the wrong amount of police are called out falsely it gives therefore the police the opportunity to prepare to prepare for a situation before they attend the scene so they might know whether they need armed response or not or dogs or whatever and it also acts as a deterrent to the general public because you sit there you see your cctv camera you know you're being watched and therefore you behave again perfect example of external social control and um, this idea of being watched was actually used in the prison system um, at the turn of the century this is a illinois state penitentiary and this is the panopticon where uh, prisoners were kept in uh, cells with a one-way mirror so they couldn't see out but the guards could see in so they never knew whether guards were watching them or not we'll do more about this in prison design but again another example of external social control and of course fear of punishment is also an example of external social control now one way of trying to achieve social control and make people conform to laws uh, in effect is it, it's a form of social control fear it's coercion definitely because it involves a threat uh, it's a threat the force will be used against you if you don't obey the law punishment's force so for example if you commit an offense you can be arrested charged convicted jailed etc and it's all against your will so the fear of being punished often makes a lot of us conform and then it acts as what is called a deterrent and deterrence some theorists such as right realists in particular think about rational choice theory back in unit two argue that fear of being caught and fear of being punished in what ensures that many many would-be criminals don't break the law and continue to obey the law in other words fear acts as a deterrent and that's what i'd be using in any answer that i'm doing on this so that then leads us through to social control theory now most of the theories of criminology that we've looked at have asked the question why do people commit crimes so if you think back to the theories that you looked at in unit two which were your biological theories so genetic theories such as jacobs xyy twin and adoption studies physiological theories such as lombroso sheldon your individualistic theories of Bandura, of Freud, of Bowlby, of Isenck, and those sociological theories of uh, functionalists like Durkheim and Merton, Becker, labeling theory, interactionism, 
Marxism and of course left and right realism, all of them are going, what is the reason why people commit crime? Now, social control theory flips everything on its head. It's the exact opposite of what we were looking at in unit two. So instead of asking why criminals break the law, it asks, why do people obey the law? What is it that causes people to obey the law? And it's looking particularly for social factors that help people obey the law. Now, here are some football fans. Now, those of you watching my video may have noticed that every single time I'm appearing in front of you, I'm wearing some sort of rugby top, mainly linked to the Exeter Chiefs. So here's my question. What is it about football fans that makes them behave in the way they are doing in this picture? And what is it about rugby fans, such as the ones in this picture, in particular this bloke? They've all been drinking. They're all mixed. So there's opposition fans in there, but they're all behaving. In fact, I go to rugby virtually every single week and police officers are not present in the grounds. If you go to football, they are. So um, social factors are influencing the behaviour here. And what, um, what control theory is asking is asking the question, why, not why are these people breaking the law, it's asking, why are these people choosing to behave? What are the reasons behind it? So it's an illustration of the thinking behind it. Not what's causing this, but why is this the case? So social control theory is basically proposing that people's relationships, their commitments, their values, their norms, their mores and beliefs encourage them not to break the law. That's what it's doing. And just a reminder that norms, just some terminology here, are, is acceptable behaviour within a society or culture. It's what's considered polite or rude, and it may differ from society or culture, or um, from society and culture to society and culture. So examples of norms in our society would be queuing, wearing a black tie to a funeral, giving up a seat on a bus to an OAP, saying please, saying thank you. And just a reminder that mores are those moral beliefs, those good or bad ways of behaving that are much more deeply ingrained within a society and culture. They're more the essential or characteristic customs and conventions of a society or a community. They're, they're the ones that you don't break. So to give an example, um, you could look at the subservient role of women in some cultures, uh, respect for the elderly in others, or in the case of America, respect for the flag, or indeed tipping in America. If you don't tip, you're completely persona non grata, whereas in England, if you don't give a tip, it's not a major social faux pas. So it's more a more in tipping in America than it is um, a norm. Uh, sorry, it's a more and a norm, whereas in, um, in England it's a norm, but it's not a more if you don't. So that's the difference between a more and a norm. So let's have a look at some uh, theories. So we can look at Travis Hershey, social bond theory. There he is, Travis Hershey. And basically, Hershey says that delinquent acts occur when an individual's bond to society is weak or broken. So according to Hershey, the individual's bond to society has got four elements, which are attachment. So the more we're attached to others, the more we care about their opinion of us. And if we care about our, their opinion of us, the more we are likely to respect their norms and the less likely we are to break them. And that's especially true of attachments to parents and teachers. So you don't want to upset people. Oh, I couldn't do that because it would upset my mum. My mum would kill me. My dad would never speak to me again. Or, oh, I can't do that. Mr. Sprenkel would never, would, you know, would, would be so disappointed. Whatever. OK, that's what Hershey means by attachment. Secondly, he talks about commitment. 
the more committed we are to a conventional lifestyle, the more we risk losing by getting involved in crime. So the more likely we are to conform. If you're adhering to the norms of society, you've got a house, you've got a family, you've got children, got a good job, you could lose that all if you commit a crime. So you don't because you don't want to lose what you have committed to within society. Thirdly, involvement, Hershey talks about. And it, he says the more we're involved in conventional law abiding activities, such as studying or participating in sports, the less time and energy we'll have for getting involved in criminal activities. And this is why I've got these pictures of the, um, the Cub Scouts up here and youth clubs here, because actually this idea of involvement is used to justify money spent on youth clubs. The fact that your parents want you to join the Scouts or a football team because it's keeping you off the streets, it's making you behave, it's making you a part of something, a part of society. And finally, Hershey talks about beliefs. If we've been socialised, to believe it's right to obey the law, then obviously we are less likely to break it. And parenting plays a key role. Many control theorists have emphasized the role of parenting in creating those bonds that prevent young people from offending. Low self-control is a major cause of delinquency, many argue. That low self-control results from poor socialisation, inconsistent or absent parental discipline. And Hershey and Godfredson particularly say that. And Riley and Shaw agree. And Riley and Shaw argue that parents should involve themselves in their teenagers' lives, spend time with them, take an interest in what they do at school and how they spend their lives with friends and show strong disapproval of criminal behaviour and explain the consequences of offending. So again, you're looking for that reason why people behave. Good parenting, strong parenting, parents that take an interest, parents that take a, a, are involved, feeling a part of society, parents that encourage you to join the scouts, join the clubs, playing a football team, whatever. Walter Reckless came up with containment theory. He pointed out the importance again of parenting, of socialization. He said, you've got psychological tendencies that can lead to criminality, but effective socialization provides this internal containment, gives us this self-control to resist the temptation to offend. He talked about pushes and pulls that make you, that lean you towards criminality or not. And he argued that external controls, such as parental discipline, provide this external containment that stops us from committing crime and makes us uh, behave and toe the line. And finally, on to my final slide, uh, where we can look at feminism here. And feminists have used control theory to explain women's low rate of offending. There's um, you know, only 3,000 women roughly in prison in, in, America, in um, the UK today, as opposed to 80,000 men. So uh, Francis Higginson argues that the male dominated society controls females more closely. Therefore, that makes it harder for them to offend. Um, Pat Carlin here um, says that, for example, women spend more time on domestic duties leaves them less opportunity to engage in criminality outside the home. And Carlin found that females that do it to offend had often failed to form an attachment to parents because they'd suffered abuse in the family or been brought up in care. So that is uh, forms of social control. It's really important that you understand the different types, examples of internal, examples of external, formal informal sanctions etc it comes up all the time in the exam good luck making sure you really understand that and i'll see you soon for another powerpoint take care